President Biden played running back in college. Well, today, he's on the offensive line for Democrats. And yes, we are leaning into the football analogy because his party may need some protection in the pocket from a possible red wave in the House. You've got President Biden going cross country, not to seats they want to flip, but to seats they already have and where Republicans are sensing an opportunity. We're gonna break down these closing messages in the final weekend of the midterms. Can you believe it? It's here. We've got the angles covered live in the field, including in tonight's original. Our exclusive report on misinformation, potentially on a huge platform you might use, TikTok, and what it means for younger voters. We're also gonna get the backstory from our road warriors, our team of political reporters in the field, a behind the scenes look on how they're surviving, covering all these campaigns, the inside scoop on what they eat and when they sleep, not all that much of either. Plus, Elon Musk, he's firing a whole bunch of workers today at Twitter. And by doing so, there's this question, did he break the law? We're going to get into the total chaos here as advertisers now start to pull out. And some controversy for Rihanna. Why some folks want her to hashtag ditch Depp after putting him in her new fashion show. We've got that backlash later on in the broadcast. Hey, I'm Hallie. And right now, you've got President Biden working overtime to try to stop a potential rout by Republicans in the House. As we speak, he's on a plane to Chicago to help out a Democrat in the type of tough suburban House seat that the party's kind of worried about right now. He's actually coming from another one of those districts, too, near San Diego, where Representative Mike Levin is in a toss-up race The Democrats say is on red alert. We've got the president talking up the economy and his semiconductor funding law, promising that the economy and inflation specifically, the cost of living, how expensive everything is getting. Our economy continues to grow and add jobs. Our economy continues to grow and add jobs, even as gas prices continue to come down. We've got a lot more to do. We also know folks are still struggling with inflation. It's our number one priority. And we got the final look at the economy today before the midterms, the last jobs report before Election Day, showing 261,000 jobs added in October. Unemployment's up a little bit. Wage growth is slightly down. Overall, generally, right, these numbers are good for Americans. Maybe not so much for a Fed that wants the economy to slow down. And if the president's an offensive lineman today trying to protect House Dems, Kevin McCarthy is the linebacker eyeing the sack, right, going to the same district that President Biden's on his way to right now. You see here where the House Majority Leader is going between now, Minority Leader, I should say, is going between now and Tuesday. And there's a big split screen showdown in Pennsylvania tomorrow. Three presidents showing up for Senate candidates. President Biden in Philly, President Obama with him. Former President Trump in the Pittsburgh area for Mehmet Oz, as the Democrats are with John Fetterman, with a lot of questions about whether Mr. Trump is there more for Oz or for himself. That's a conversation for later in the show with 2024 speculation surrounding Mr. Trump. In a sec, we'll talk Pennsylvania with Dasha Burns, but I want to start with Ali Rafa, who is in Southern California. And the red alert for Democrats in the House is really clear here, Ali. You just got to follow the money to see where Leader McCarthy thinks his targets should be in the closing days. We've talked a lot about the balance of power in the Senate, but what's the state of play in the House? Yeah, Hallie, and that red alert is exactly the reason why you're seeing the Democratic Party send out its top brass fanning out across the country in these last few days uh, before the midterms. Because of this graphic that I want to show you right here, there are more than two times the amount of Democratic House seats that are now considered toss-ups uh, than Republican House seats. Many of those seats now becoming toss-ups recently, going from lean Democratic to toss-ups in the last few weeks, including uh, the race here in California. California's 49th congressional district uh, with Democratic incumbent Mike Levin. That is the reason President Biden was here today to shore up support for that congressman because of uh, some changes to this race recently, specifically because of some redistricting, redistricting rather, that was done uh, that favors uh, Republicans here. So that's why you're seeing President Biden and so many Democrats go out across the country over the next few days because they know that the strategy to change, uh, possibly change people's minds. Uh, it's too late for that. They know that their best option in these last few days is to really secure the support and ensure the support of their base, uh, trying to get as many voters out to the polls as possible, making them realize what's at stake in these midterms, Hallie. Uh, you know, the economy is such a huge issue. Um, I talked with a couple of folks, the Republican and the Democratic candidate running in one New Jersey district, right? So a more, I think you could fair, fair to say, like centrist, moderate district. 
all about the economy, right? All about the economy. We're seeing other candidates, the Republican contingent in Arizona, talking border, right? We've seen Carrie Lake and Blake Masters and the rest of the Republicans running there talk about it. Talk about the GOP closing message here with four days to go. If President Biden is talking economy, threats to democracy, it seems like inflation and, and immigration are two big ones for Republicans. That's exactly right. Inflation, the state of the economy, uh, the two biggest concerns for voters uh, that's shown in poll after poll. And that is what we're seeing from Republicans. But it seems like the White House is taking uh, is realizing the message here. Remember, we saw so many Republicans uh, come out after Biden's speech on Tuesday talking about the state of democracy, democracy being on the ballot. And it seems like he has gotten the message because that was uh, partially a, a, a very big focus of his uh, speech here today in Carlsbad talking about uh, infrastructure plan, how that could help uh, create jobs, talking about gas prices. I could tell you just from driving here today, uh, gas is nearly $6 a gallon here. Uh, Biden acknowledging that that's a huge problem for Californians and, and voters all across the country. He also talked about uh, veterans' access to health care. San Diego obviously uh, has the largest military community in the United States. So economy, inflation not lost on President Biden and the Democrats' uh, top brass as they head out across the country over the next few days, Hallie. Hallie Rafa live for us there in Carlsbad, California. Allie, thank you. Let's head across the country to Dasha Burns, who's posted up in Pennsylvania. Lieutenant Governor of the Democratic candidate John Fetterman, running for Senate, has been in this county you're in talking the economy too. But over near Philly, it was about abortion access. We know that's another motivating issue specifically for Democratic voters. It's a little bit of a sort of targeted message here from him. Yeah, that's exactly right, Hallie. And he was in Montgomery County, which is one of the caller counties around Philadelphia, the suburbs that have really been a major battleground here. And the messaging in that area from the Fetterman campaign has largely been focused on abortion. But I'll tell you, when I talk to voters there, a big concern I hear from them is crime and economy. And that's something that Oz has been hammering. So look, in this final stretch, you're really hearing the culmination of the messaging that these campaigns have been putting out over the course of this campaign campaign season. Uh, but for voters that we talk to, Hallie, it really is the economy and crime. Our number one is what we hear over and over and yeah. over again. One potential bright spot for Democrats, though, is uh, this guy that's about to show up at the IBEW uh, Union Hall here right now, Josh Shapiro. He is miles ahead of his Republican opponent, Doug Mastriano, in the governor's race here. And Democrats are hoping that maybe he'll be able to pull up the rest of the ticket and potentially help Fetterman here, too. It is obviously crunch time in the midterms, but it is also Oprah season because she is out now with a big endorsement that <laughs> Mehmet Oz is yep. trying to play down right now. Oprah, obviously, really well known for, let me say, many things. But one of the things she did was put Oz on the map, mm -hmm. helping to brand him as America's doctor. She is now endorsing John Fetterman in this Pennsylvania race. Fetterman's campaign was like ecstatic. You saw Fetterman out this morning just basically seeming like yeah. it was just such an awesome thing for him. A um, lot of big names coming to Pennsylvania. We talked about Barack Obama, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, et cetera. How much does that, right, the sort of big gun factor, factor in with the voters that you talk to? You know, it, it really is hard to say, Hallie, because this race is so tight, like any gust of wind could potentially tip the balance totally. here. But at the same time, voters are so focused on paying their bills, right, and not maybe paying so much attention to celebrity endorsements. But you're right, this is a big one, especially because of the relationship that Oz uh, has had with Oprah, which is why I think you're going to hear Fetterman talking about it a lot over the next few days, kind of just trying to dig into um, his opponent a little bit there. He was on The View today. Day, talking about it, uh, Oz playing it down, saying, look, we, we love Oprah, but we have different politics. Um, and he's been focusing on trying to paint Fetterman as more extreme. But listen, this weekend, he's going to be on stage with Trump and Doug Mastriano, which, you know, might help or potentially hurt him if he's trying to focus on that moderate lane in the last stretch here, Hallie. Dasha Burns rocking the campaign trail out there in Pennsylvania. Dasha, thank you. We are hearing now from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi for the very first time in person since the attack on her husband Paul in their home in San Francisco last week. In a private virtual meeting, she's telling supporters that her husband's recovery is going to be a long haul. The Speaker's office is releasing that. I want you to watch. It's going to be a long haul, but he will be well. And it, it's just so tragic how it happened. But nonetheless, we have to be optimistic. He's surrounded by family, so that's a wonderful thing. 
Speaker Pelosi there, by the way, now just four days out from the midterms, of course, then pivoting and talking about the stakes this election day. Let's talk tech, because it seems like everybody is, right? With Twitter, like the talk of the world here. Elon Musk tweeting today the company's losing a bunch of money after some big companies stopped advertising on the platform. You know what else the company is losing? A whole bunch of its employees. Musk is apparently confirming at a conference today that the company is planning to fire half its workers. That would be about 3,700 people with no jobs. And now former employees are using the platform, Twitter, to announce they've been laid off, saying some of them that they were locked out of their work systems, locked out of their email accounts. They apparently could still get into their Twitter accounts. The layoffs have also triggered a class action lawsuit, which claims the company did not give workers a 60-day warning that the law requires. I want to bring in now Jake Ward, and let's talk about what it's like kind of inside the building, because one employee described the wait for, like, the, the pink slip email as total chaos. What else do we know about a, a moment when it seems like morale, fair to say, is, like, down in the dumps? And I mean that technically. Well, here's, I mean, check it out this way, uh, Hallie. When you try to reach out to Twitter for official comment on what's going on over there right now, you get no response. And in fact, most of the comms team seems to have been laid off. And we know that because they are tweeting out, some of them, that they've been dismissed. And so we're really in this position where it's just not clear sort of who is left or what is going on. But we know that it is, you know, deep cuts across the board. All sorts of teams have been very badly affected. And some of them are the kinds of teams that uh, you really uh, would want to have in place, especially going into the midterms, teams that are in charge of things so, like yeah. content moderation, you know, uh, curation and trending topics. All of those sorts of teams are affected. And so at this point, it's really quite alarming to see just how much of that company has been dismissed, not just because, you know, we obviously feel for anybody who loses their job in this day and age, but also because these are, in many cases, the people who have built the guardrails that exist on that platform. Let me ask you, I want to come back to this misinformation point in a second, but let me ask you about this lawsuit, because I, I just put the question to you. Are the layoffs illegal? Twitter says yes, because they're still paying these people even after they got pink slipped, right, and, and they don't work there. But what are you hearing from experts? Well, this is the thing, right? Uh, tech companies have used that as a way of getting, uh, you know, have used their money essentially as a way of getting around this problem uh, in the past. So in the United States, if you are a company with more than 100 employees, you're supposed to give 60 days notice under something called the WARN Act. In other countries, like the United Kingdom, it's actually a shorter amount of time, and the penalties for noncompliance are even greater. The thing is, what we're seeing in the emails that these people have received as of this morning is that they're essentially told, you are now locked out of the system, you don't do any more work for us, but you you do remain an employee for a couple of more months. So this may be just a very sophisticated way of getting out of that requirement, but it's also one that, of course, is going to cost everybody at least two months' salary or cost Twitter at least two months' salary for those people in addition to whatever severance package they wind up offering. So talk a bit more about then the thing that everybody's talking about where I live in Washington. I know where you live in Silicon Valley, it's all Twitter. Here, it's all midterms. There is an intersection of this, right? Because there is a concern now, and you alluded to it, that like the timing of what's being described as chaos at Twitter is coinciding with a super, super important point in the country's democratic process. And Twitter, while it doesn't have the user base that Facebook does, uh, supporters of Twitter point out it's still an influential user base with leaders and politicians and lots of people on it. That's right. I mean, when an elected official or a police department or a registrar of voters wants to make an official pronouncement, they very often do it on Twitter because it's a place that journalists rely on and the public relies on to get official word often from those sorts of official sources. The difficulty we have here, right, is that over the last few years, we have seen all sorts of groups basically workshopping their tactics for getting around that, sabotaging our understanding of the truth. In many cases, they they are actively seeking to create a untrustworthy environment. And it has been the job of teams like the content moderation team, like uh, the curation team, like the AI ethics team that looks at how the algorithm plays into all of this. It's been their job to try and keep everything verified and factual and give us all a reliable experience on that platform. Now, with half the company laid off, it's not quite clear how effectively they are going to be able to do that going into the midterms. And I think in the same way that we saw you know, uh, the uptick in hate speech in the days after Elon Musk first took over, because that was obviously an effort by trolls and hate groups to try to test the fences. I think we're about to see the, tents, the fences get tested in a whole Yikes. new way this upcoming week, Hallie. Jake Ward, I know you're going to have a busy weekend and next week ahead of you as well. Thank you, Fran. I appreciate you being with us.
Let's turn now to some new numbers out today from the CDC showing a kind of double whammy here. The number of people getting vaccinated for the flu and COVID is down, even as positive flu tests and hospitalizations are the highest they've been in 10 years, okay? Kind of not great. Here's what the numbers show, that only about 8% of Americans older than the age of five have gotten the new COVID boosters. And compared to this time last year, 5 million fewer adults have gotten their flu shots. So not as many people are getting flu shots. For kid flu shots, it's like about the same as last year, but down 6% from pre-pandemic rates, which is more of the apples to apples comparison, experts say. So, okay, not as many people are getting vaccinated for flu, but look at this. See this chart? Look at that spike on the end there. That's because positive flu tests, people in the hospital from flu, they're the highest they've been in a decade. Two kids have died. And then you have this issue of the triple-demic, not just flu and COVID that we talked about, but RSV, a respiratory issue. The number of people with that is at a two-year high. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is working the health beat tonight. Like we said it, we can be pretty plain English about it. These stats are not awesome, okay? Fewer people getting vaccinated, more people getting sick, hospitals getting really, really full. How does this play out? Yeah, not awesome at all, Hallie. And yes, uh, I just spoke with a doctor uh, over at Texas Children's in Houston uh, who told me that the positivity rate uh, for the flu uh, has doubled in the past few weeks. So we keep seeing these stats get worse and worse over the last couple of weeks. And to be clear, you know, pre-pandemic, it is not unusual to think for things to get worse as we head into the winter. But what we have been seeing over the last couple of weeks, not just with the flu, not just with RSV, is that this is happening sooner and sooner in the season. So the question will be, how will the rest of the season end up? When will this peak? And will there be new COVID variants this winter that, uh, you know, doctors may be accounting for, as you just talked about, the possibility for that triple-demic. But the latest numbers from the CDC basically say that flu is getting much worse in the last few weeks. RSV is also high and going up nationally, but there are some parts of the country, Hallie, that are starting to see a slight, very slight decrease in RSV, yeah. but the flu, though, is going up significantly now. Um, okay, flu, you've laid that out. Let's talk mm -hmm. RSV, because mm -hmm. you've been reporting on this, the rise in RSV that's putting a real stress in the hospital system, and I know you've had a chance to talk with parents who, who have kids in the hospital from this. Tell me more. Uh, yeah, Hallie. So, you know, today I spoke with one mom who is in a hospital in an ICU in St. Petersburg. She just got there just yesterday. Her uh, child, just three years old, uh, got RSV, now is down with pneumonia, and he's in the ICU. And you keep hearing from these parents that most of them had obviously heard of RSV, but didn't know it could be this serious. And it can be serious for some very young ch children and older adults. You know, a few days ago, we were in Phoenix, and we were speaking with a mom there. We spoke with her inside her hospital room as she was taking care of her young child. Take a listen to what she told us. It's a serious illness, you know, with him being this young. He doesn't have an immune system to fight it off, so uh, I just have to trust in the doctors and nurses to take care of him and just love on him as much as they can. So, yeah, parents across this country, how they are bracing for this winter of flu, COVID, and RSV. We'll just have to see how it plays out. Again, flu yeah. now is, is on the rise, Hallie. I'll tell you, Gabe, you know, we talk about a lot on the show, like, what's in the group chats? This is in all of mine and, like, my, my mom groups. Like, yeah. this, is, this is the thing. Gabe Gutierrez, thanks for staying on top of this beat for us. Today, you've got President Putin using Russia's National Unity Day to share that more than 300,000 soldiers, he says, have joined the war in Ukraine now. He also had a conversation with the Turkish president and apparently told him to send grain to some East African countries for free. Now, this is a big deal, right? There's been a lot of back and forth over this grain deal to try to safely let ships move through the Black Sea port because they're really important, obviously. Many African countries depend on this grain to eat, to survive, for food. Our Keir Simmons, you see him there. That's him traveling to Kenya to see how much of this grain is actually getting to the people who need it most. Hey, Hallie, well, we're just wrapping up three days of reporting here in Kenya, and so much of it has been heartbreaking. Let me just tell you one story. We went to a hospital supported by UNICEF, and there we met mother and child, mother and child, each of these little ones suffering from severe malnutrition. I met a mother, Mary Ayer, and her four-month-old baby. She told us that she's had to decide which of her children to give 
food to all of the livestock that supported her family dead because of a drought here that has now lasted for four years. We're in the fifth year. So you can imagine, if food stops coming from Ukraine, it's going to make the situation even more serious. And just this week, President Putin threatened to do exactly that, to use his blockade of the Black Sea to prevent any more shipments of crucial food from leaving Ukraine. Now, the World Food Programme tells us that already they are dealing with a huge crisis. Now, Hallie, no matter what happens with Ukraine and Russia, the crisis here in East Africa is escalating. We do expect a declaration that neighbouring Somalia is now in famine any time. Now, that will be the first time that that country has seen a famine for 10 years. The last time there was a famine there, 250,000 people died, half of them children. And it may not stop there because folks here that we've spoken to have told us that the rains that they haven't seen for years, if they don't come soon, then many other places here are going to suffer just the same. Because remember, it isn't just about having enough water. It's about having the water to feed your animals so that you can eat, to, to make sure that your crops grow so that you can eat. And of course, on top of all of that, and this includes the Ukraine crisis and COVID and world inflation, global food prices are escalating too. So it's making it harder for organizations like UNICEF to get the food to the people here who truly need it. You know, Hallie, we've heard so much about Ukraine this year. I think you're going to hear much about this part of the world in the months to come and, and for all the wrong reasons. Hallie. Our Keir Simmons in Kenya for us tonight. Our thanks to Keir and his team for bringing that to us. Coming up here on the show, it is getting more and more tense between North and South Korea, if you can believe it. Why Seoul says it had to scramble fighter jets today. Plus, the jackpot for tomorrow's Powerball drawing. Gang, it's the biggest lottery prize in the world ever. We'll tell you how big. Coming up with the five things. A couple days from now, Rihanna's Savage X Fenty show will air on Amazon. But today, she's facing some big backlash over the move to include Johnny Depp, especially in a show whose whole M.O. is diversity and inclusion. People online using the Ditch Depp hashtag with one user saying, we will boycott the show if Depp is in it. Somebody else tweeting that Depp's been embraced as a hero by, quote, unhinged right-wing misogynist extremists, adding, really disappointing, Rihanna. Remember, Depp recently won a defamation case against his ex-wife, Amber Heard, who accused Depp of abusing her during their marriage. Kristen Dahlgren is joining us now. So, Kristen, um, Depp's in the show. His appearance has been confirmed by NBC News, but there's still a couple days left until this thing actually airs. There are people calling for him to be edited out of the final cut. Is it your sense, based on the reporting that you're doing, that the backlash could move the needle at all on that front? Well, there's a lot of people uh, that are hopeful now, and it's important to note that this isn't just like a cameo appearance. Depp would actually be the first male to star uh, in a featured moment in a Savage X Fenty show. And so, you know, it's a cameo, but it is a, a, a rather significant role, uh, clearly part of Depp's rehabilitation. And it's unlikely that this would have happened without some careful consideration uh, from Rihanna's team as well. You know, Depp's trial was polarizing, though. And so having scrolled through the hashtags over the past couple hours, I must say that there is also a lot of support for Depp, a lot of support uh, for Rihanna. For her part, she has stayed silent on it, hasn't said anything on Twitter. Uh, to give you some historical context, though, in 2020, she did use an Islamic text in one of her shows in a song. And so there was huge backlash for that as well. She did remove the song from streaming and she apologized for that. So nothing's off the table at this point. The show uh, premieres on the 9th. And so there is still time. It's something I bet we'll be talking about a lot over the next few days. Yeah, um, you know, part of this too, and I, and I hear you that the sort of online chatter has kind of gone both ways on this, but it does seem like this has put a spotlight on high-profile celebrities of after they've been accused of abuse. Obviously, we've talked about Johnny Depp's trial. He largely came out the victor in that trial, essentially. Um, but there are some fans who are highlighting Rihanna's past relationship with Chris Brown, who was arrested for physically assaulting her back in 2009, eventually pleaded guilty to that. Right, and that's being brought up a lot, too. Look, this is the, you know, post-Me Too uh, conversation that we're having in a lot of cases, you know, 
when, if at all, are there second chances or, or when should be able to, should people be able to resume sort of high profile lives after these type of accusations? Um, as far as the Rihanna and Chris Brown incident goes, you know, she has talked about it. Uh, she also called out Snapchat in 2010 for an ad that was sort of making light of that situation. I want to read you real quick what she said. She said, I'd love to call it ignorance, but I know you ain't that dumb. She went on to say that she doesn't have a lot of personal feelings about the incident anymore, but that the platform let all victims down. And so she was very clear in speaking out against that use of what happened to her a lot of people saying there are some parallels here and that they don't think that she should be giving Johnny Depp this platform here. As you say, Kristen, I'm sure there'll be a lot of talk about this over the next few days. Kristen Dahlgren, thank you for bringing us that story. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, South Korea says it scrambled dozens of military jets today after detecting about 180 North Korean warplanes flying near the country's shared border. This was just hours after Pyongyang fired more than 80 rounds of artillery in protest of Seoul's joint military drills with the U.S. Number two, too much drinking is increasingly killing middle-aged people in this country. It got worse during the pandemic, and now this new report from the CDC says alcohol-related deaths rose by 26% overall from 2019 to 2020. For women, if you're between the ages of 35 to 44, listen to this, went up 42%. Just to put that in context, alcohol-related deaths had already been going up, but they've never jumped more than 7% in the last two decades or so. A significant finding. Number three, Florida's state medical board has reportedly restricted doctors from providing treatments to minors seeking gender transitions. Doctors are going to have to wait until trans patients are 18 to either prescribe puberty blockers and hormones or to perform surgeries. This is only going to apply to minors who want to start getting treatments, not those who already are receiving those treatments. It's expected to go into effect after a 21-day public comment period. Number four, if you feel like there's not enough time in your day, you're about to get lucky because Sunday is going to be 25 hours long. Well, hey, extra hours of sleep. One hour, that sounds good, right? Downside, the sun will set an hour earlier now. So if you're up in Maine, guess what? Sunset is like 4.30 on Sunday. Not as bad as Fairbanks, Alaska, where the sun sets at 4.11. But this is it. Winter is coming. The darkness descends. Number five, lottery officials are calling tomorrow's Powerball drawing the biggest lottery jackpot ever, jackpot, I should say, $1.6 billion. If you decide to cash out, you're going to get like 782 million bucks. Are you going to go buy a Powerball ticket? I don't know. I, $780 million to tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. And tonight it is TikTok because you're probably on it. You know, it has a little something for everybody there. It is so super duper popular with people who are younger. I feel like I always sound so old when I say that. It's popular with the youths, but honestly, like a lot of people are on it. And there are some questions now ahead of the midterms, right? We talked about it with Twitter earlier. How does a big social media platform like this stop disinformation before it gets to you, before it gets to voters, before election day? I talked exclusively with two former TikTok moderators who for the first time were appearing on network TV, sounding the alarm on this. Listen. It's one of the most downloaded apps on the planet and after Google, the most visited website. But ahead of Election Day, TikTok may be facing its biggest political test yet. And these former content moderators fear the platform is not up to the task. Do you think TikTok, based on what you have seen behind the curtain there as content moderators, is prepared to handle misinformation on its app ahead of the midterms? I think certainly they're going to pay more attention to it now. But I still don't think that they have a good enough safety net set up to prevent misinformation. Reese Young and Ashley Velez worked for companies contracted by TikTok. Their jobs, they say, to almost instantly analyze hundreds or even thousands of videos every day, sometimes in less than 30 seconds, according to them, to see if they violate TikTok standards. That includes political misinformation, like whether content was manipulated or full of conspiracy theories or hate speech. Was it immediately obvious to you when something was political misinformation? Did you feel comfortable making those determinations in the 12 seconds you had to look at that video? No, I, there was no way anybody I feel could feel comfortable watching a video at a one and a half times speed with, for 12 seconds and being told that you have to make all these correct decisions or you're doing your job wrong. Did you really feel up to that? I went to school for music, <laughs> so no. That should tell you all you need to know.
Both have sued TikTok for what they describe as immense stress and psychological harm for what they witnessed while moderating content, a suit since dismissed, though they plan to refile with that option left open by the judge. They describe in the lawsuit a nightmare, claiming they were forced to watch not just political conspiracies, but videos containing bestiality, necrophilia, a child execution, alleging they did not have enough training or support, and now sounding the alarm. The rate at which misinformation spreads is crazy. Votes are going to be decided based on what is pushed to people's for you feeds. That algorithm is built for you. TikTok does not accept paid political ads or allow campaign fundraising, but politics pops up as part of other content fed to users for you pages through a powerful algorithm, which TikTok says tailors what you see to your own personal interests. We have a lot to worry about in the lead up to the election, because if this kind of blatant election mis and disinformation is slipping through, I can't even imagine what else is slipping through, and it's a huge problem. NYU and Global Witness conducted an investigation rolling out videos containing disinformation to see which platforms would let them slip through the cracks. They targeted five battleground states with 10 ads in English and 10 in Spanish, half of which contained false claims like, already voted in the primary, you can stay home. It would say things like you need to be vaccinated to vote. So very obvious mis- and disinformation. And what we found was that TikTok fared the worst. They did not stop. 90% of the ads were approved. TikTok, in response, says in part, we value feedback from NGOs, academics, and other experts, which helps us continually strengthen our processes and policies. And it does have policies against misinformation. The company says it's removed nearly 60,000 videos from the platform and teamed up with more than a dozen fact-checking partners around the world who help review content. They've also launched an election center to try to protect the integrity of the platform. They say they'll work to keep harmful misinformation off the app and will report the latest election results from the Associated Press. As for the lawsuit, the company does not comment on ongoing litigation, but in a court filing said, quote, the significant social utility to content moderation grossly out outweighs any danger to moderators. Now, with Election Day around the corner and early voting in full swing, it's no longer Velez and Young's job to moderate that political content. For them, for now, they say, a relief. What advice would you give somebody in your job now? Uh, quit. <laughs> You're the first line of defense, but what about your defense? Who's defending you? Because they're not. I want to bring in now Ben Collins, one of our NBC team members here who covers the misinfo and disinfo beat. Um, and, you know, Ben, you and I had talked about this story, obviously, before it aired and, and sort of what what the landscape is as it relates specifically to TikTok misinformation. Um, TikTok's already been through an election cycle, a couple of them. You know, this isn't the first one, but I think it's fair to say it's probably their highest profile one yet. Talk about what you see as the challenge for this platform and how they're trying to meet this moment. Yeah, first of all, Hallie, I want to say a really good job on that. That was very well done. And second of all, Thank you. I, I, I will say, you know, this is a black box. TikTok is the biggest black box in the internet. People simply do not know how they get from point A to point B. And even you're these people. more than Facebook, more than Twitter. You think it's like more than those other platforms. Oh, my God, of course. And like okay. e even these people that you just talked to, they don't really even seem to know how people get served content either. I mean, it's a. Oh, I asked about the algorithm. And Reese, one of the people you saw there was like, I, you know as much as I do. You know what I mean? Right. Exactly. So, like, if people uh, come across rumors or lies or things telling them they can't vote, they don't even know where it came from or when they saw it within the stream of one zillion videos they, they uh, scrolled by over the course of this thing. So that's the issue with TikTok is, at least with Twitter, you can go back and be like, oh, at least I found it from this tweet, and then you can send it to your friend, and your friends can be like, that's insane. Um, with TikTok, it's sort of lost into the wilderness once you lose track of it. And that is a much bigger issue uh, long term for this platform. It doesn't really have any accountability measures whatsoever. What's the solve then, right? I mean, is it? And, and I think TikTok will say, like, hey, we've got election centers. We, we they, they sort of have framed this, I think, publicly, like, as they direct people to where people need to go to get good information. Is the solution, like, congressional regulation, which, by the way, I've talked with Republicans and Democrats have been trying to do this for years and haven't gotten anything passed. Like, where does the solve lie? Is it is it on us as users? It, right now, it's on us as users. It doesn't have to be a hammer solution where it's just one thing. It can be a bunch of things. Can, like for TikTok, be very you know pretty straightforward. It can be uh, you know open up your algorithm so we can see what's actually going on there. We can see what, yeah. what's going on. But with Twitter, it can be something else completely different. You know, now it's going to be something else very different with Twitter. Well, right. But uh, uh, you know, each each different platform needs a different solution, and they should work with NG. They should volunteer themselves to NGOs first uh, to see a good way of going about it. Ben Collins, great to see you. Thank you very much. We'll be talking with you. I know more next week in the midterms. Appreciate it.
So our team has sources saying that soon, maybe like this month soon, former President Trump could officially, officially, for real, declare his candidacy for 2024. Now listen, have I covered this president before? Sure, when he was in the White House. So for context, any timing, you've got to take with a grain of salt. You just do, right? But if he has, in fact, decided on November and has, in fact, decided he'll make an announcement this month, the timing's really interesting. Why? Check out the calendar. President Biden's going to be in Asia for a week. On the 14th, the former president, Mr. Trump, is supposed to talk with the January 6th committee. There is zero sign he's actually going to do that. And then a day after that, his former VP, Mike Pence, is releasing a book. He and Pence aren't really super tight right now, especially with Pence signaling he plans his own 2024 run. Kristen Welker is on the team that broke this story for us here at NBC News. And Kristen... I feel like we're back in the White House. I do, too. Circa 20, 2018, baby. Deja you know? all over um, again. And I think, listen, we, we laid out the grain of salt caveat, yeah. which I think is important here, because he could be floating a trial balloon, right? Um, he could push it. He could slide. I know that what you're hearing from sources is that whatever happens on Tuesday, election night, could actually be really important in this thought process. Absolutely. Look, here's what we know. He and his inner circle are eyeing this month, and he's really teased that, Hallie, publicly himself. He said he's very, very, very probably going to do it while speaking in Iowa last night. But as you say, and as you and I reported for four straight years, the president likes trial balloons. Yeah. So any timing, any policy, any issue he likes to throw out there, he likes to consider the public reaction and then make his final decision. But as you say, the midterms are next Tuesday. He knows right now that we are saying Republicans seem to have the momentum. Right. So it, it seems like he wants to ride that wave. But I bet you he's going to assess what happens on Tuesday. He's also never been married to plans, right? Meaning, That's like, right. you can have the stage set, you can have the stage lit, you can have the mic microphone hot and he a piece of legislation yeah, on his right. desk and he may just walk away right like so that's something else too is at any moment this could change what i what i also think is worth talking about here is what an early declaration of a presidential run could mean for the rest of the field right because typically you know i think back to when we were covering the campaigns in 2016 in 2015 we were out talking about people and that was early when it was like yes. early 2015 the year before an election right. here we are like almost two full years before an election there's some thinking, does he box out other candidates? I have a hard time seeing, like, Mike Pence decide not to run. Right. If he, because all the speculation, Ron DeSantis. Th these, these are people who have all known that Donald Trump was likely to throw his hat back in the ring and who have still been laying the groundwork for their own races. Absolutely. There's no doubt, though, Hallie, he would like to freeze the field. Uh, does sure he put, wants uh, to. Exactly. But I think you're right. Th I mean, based on all of our reporting that you and I have done, Pence is going to run regardless if he makes that yeah. final decision, which he hasn't yet. And Ron DeSantis, Governor Ron DeSantis, is making every indication, every sign that he plans to get into this race. And if you look at the polls, he's potentially his closest challenger, his toughest challenger. So I think you're right that it doesn't impact them, but it could impact some of the other potential candidates who are out there, some of the other governors who mm -hmm. are eyeing a potential run. And I think it'll be interesting. But uh, look, I think that the bottom line line is former President Trump wants to get into the game. He wants to do it at a moment that will have the biggest splash. Whenever he announces, it will be a political bombshell. That's the bottom line. You kind of have to think, though, can we can we just get through this election? Yes. I mean, like, let's just, I Kristen, mean, let's get to Tuesday, girl. From now or until next Tuesday. Tuesday plus election week, as we exactly. call it around here. Weeks. Um, Chief White House Gross. So Brian, good Kristen to Walker. see you. Thank you, friend. Yeah, happy Appreciate Friday to you. you. Thank you, Thanks darling. for having me. Thanks. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And can you guess, it is almost the midterms. So yes, we will be doing a midterms themed backstory. We wanted to take you out on the trail with our cast of superstar reporters who have been out there for months, right? Talking with voters, talking with candidates, getting in touch with the pulse of the country now. Between the not a lot of sleep and the lot of frequent flyer miles, they help keep our reporting um, really up there. Shaq Brewster, Vaughn Hilliard, Ali Vitale, all three of them first started reporting on the campaign trail during the 2016 presidential election as campaign embeds. Look at these baby reporters, little cubs. Now they're full-grown bears, man. They, jo they join me now, Shaq and Vaughn and Ali. We, I'm so excited that you're all here with me. Thank you so much um, for joining us for the backstory, which I think all of you know. I'm scared about it really what you just like showed on, on, on screen. I know, I can't, but it's like a trip down memory lane. It really is a behind the scenes look at what is your life really like? Allie, your life is very windy right now. Okay, I'm gonna, we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. Shaq, let me, let me start with you because like, what is the difference for you from just a logistical life perspective between covering the midterms versus when you covered a presidential year? 
I think the biggest thing, Hallie, is they're just there's just so much more to cover. When you're assigned to a candidate or you're assigned to an early state when you're covering a presidential election, you're able to focus on a little bit more and they're usually talking about the same things. But here, just for example, in Wisconsin, we're covering a competitive governor's race. We're comp covering a competitive Senate race. There's an AG race. There's also the possibility that there might be a filibuster-proof uh, majority in the state assembly. So there's just a lot more that you're covering, and that's not to mention that we cover multiple states. Uh, for when sure. we're on the midterm, midterm Where are trail. You? Well, what, I'm in a car. car. I'm in the Starbucks yeah. parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, in, are you uh, for Chicago, real? Wisconsin. That is amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Wait, hold that thought because I want to come you back to what you're ordering. Um, Vaughn, let me go to you because I think you're in Arizona right now. People may or may not know that that is your home state. I happen to know that because we have been um, friends and colleagues for a very long time. But I, I would have to think, um, and I wonder, if I get this, I'm sure you, you get this question from viewers and voters, how you're growing up in Arizona is helping you cover the races that you're covering there now. Right. I mean, actually, just to be quite frank, my dream in college was to be a Phoenix political reporter. And so we're kind of getting the chance to live it out here. Uh, and I think that's actually why I spend more days in Arizona, it seems like now than I do in my actual apartment back east. Uh, look, I mean, it, my family goes back here for generations. Uh, this is home. I mean, when you cover a place that is your passion point, the place that you've grown and experienced and understand, you inherently feel a little bit more passionate about the candidates that are putting themselves out there. You feel like you've even got a little bit more of a stake in this year because you're you're hearing from family and from friends, community members that are in need or have uh, uh, urgent desires, right? Policies that they care about. When we're talking about water infrastructure, perhaps a lot of other parts of the country don't care as much about that here. But for me, that is a sexy issue here. And we actually have the right to talk about that with these candidates here. Uh, that is why getting a chance to cover home. Uh, it's fun, but it also makes it a little bit more difficult. And you've got to go and have dinner with mom and dad much more frequently. Awesome. It's, uh, and uh, you got to make time for them. <laughs> I just have one um, one fact checky quibble, which is all the issues are sexy, uh, Vaughn, obviously. So just wanted to check you on that one. Um, Allie, let me go to you because I see that you are, in, uh, I think you're on the coast of, are you in Florida right now? T tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that's where you last were on the yeah. campaign trail. Mm hmm. Well, we're in Miami. Love that. Typically, you're in Washington. Typically, you're across the street from our studio here at the Capitol, right? And I have to, like, I know that one of the things that I most appreciated about my time on the campaign trail years ago now was, like, not being in the Beltway bubble, which is a real thing that, like, frankly, candidly exists. I have to think that's really refreshing for you. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really refreshing. And frankly, I think it makes me a better reporter because I'm able to dip in and out of Capitol Hill, in and out of the Beltway. And because for me, one of the things that I immediately think of is when new policy is put forward, how does this impact the voters that I am inevitably going to go back out and talk to? And so I can ask really targeted questions that allow me to play both the inside and outside baseball game. It also, though, sort of makes sense that I'm like here between the cro crosswinds right now, because I think that's how a lot of congressional reporters feel right now on the cusp of these midterm elections. There is so much that's about to change in Congress. If Democrats hold the House, it's going to be more razor thin majorities. If Republicans take the House, we enter an entirely new phase of the Biden administration, one that's likely filled with investigations and subpoenas. It's going to make yeah. what the January 6th committee has been doing the last few months kind of look like child's play just in terms of the amount of legal jargon and understanding that we're going to have to have of arcane procedures. So the location is sort of fitting right now for a lot of reasons, but frankly, the more I can get out and then come back to Congress, totally. the better I think that it makes our reporting. You're preaching to the choir. I love that, right? Getting out. Like, it's good to be in D.C. talking to people, and it's good to be out of D.C. talking to people, too. Let me do a lightning round with you all. Some questions here. We'll go in the order that I see you on your screen, which is Shaq Von Alley. Um, and these are questions that, I will be honest, we solicited from our team and our producers that were curious about your lives here. So, Shaq, number one favorite thing you like to do if you have, like, two hours or one day off? What's your way to, like, chill out? Oh, sports, definitely. I mean, literally today we were talking about uh, going to a Bucks game later after our last live shot tonight. So <laughs> okay. any, anytime I can get a game in, we're doing it. Got it. Vaughn? Uh, I run down the road and meet up with my mom and dad and my sister, and we go and have Carolina's Mexican food, which if you come to town, there's two locations. They're great. I will consider that an open invite. Allie? 
Yeah, full disclosure, I did a live shot with a bathing suit under my clothes today because my producer Haley and I managed to sneak in an hour at the pool between live shots. I'm so Wait, sorry to I my bosses so for admitting much. that. No, they're, they're probably like <laughs> cheering you on at this point. Um, here's a question I get. I took a road trip from Savannah to Orlando with Freddie, my producer, and all I bet anybody want to know, we did like an Instagram live. They're like, what's your road trip snack? Like, what are you eating? What are you eating? What are you, like, let me go backwards. Ali, I'll start with you. What are you, like, what's the thing that keeps you going on the campaign trail? Okay, people who read my book actually made fun of me for this because I exist on oat milk lattes, mostly iced, but I can do a hot one every now and again. Otherwise, trail mix is often in our car. Vaughn? I remember, Hallie, when I was traveling on the road with you and Frank a lot, and you guys would eat some really weird stuff. <laughs> And like I bars. live off yeah. of uh, yes, you would. yeah meat bars. I think Fishing. everybody needs to understand. You could smell. You could smell what you guys were eating. I appreciate it. I live off of. Uh, in the morning, it's pumpkin bread from Starbucks and a vanilla sweet cream cold brew. And then we'll see if the rest of the day we get to anything else. Shaq, I don't even want to ask you because I know what the answer is, which is Starbucks, because you're literally in their parking lot right now. So I assume that the answer is coffee. <laughs> That's true. I knew it. Coffee right, last, I, gotta, today, I have to tell know. you, I, I fully know, and it happened. I mean, I feel this way with my producer. You would not be on TV right now if it weren't for your producers. With Kai, who's working with Shaq, PJ, with Vaughn, Haley, with Ali. PJ. I'm giving you like 10 hey. seconds each. Shout out your producers. Go, say something nice. Shaq, you first. Oh. Kai is the best. She keeps me sane. She makes sure we're, we're always at the right stop at the right time, and she acts as a therapist sometimes, too. I love that. Is that PJ? <laughs> No, uh, the Phillies, oh as you're well aware, Hallie, are in the playoffs in the World Series, and we are getting in the way of it. And last night, the Eagles were playing, too, and go somehow Bills, go oh, somehow he still gets us on television while watching the, uh, the baseball and football games off on his screen on the side. So Love to He's see great. it. And, and Allie and Haley? <laughs> Haley Talbot, in typical fashion, is hiding as far away from the camera as she possibly can, which I know Kai is too, but she is the best producer in the entire world. It's not surprising that I could go on for way more than 10 seconds with amazing things about how she lets us do our job and do it so, so well. All six of you are incredible. Your crews are great. We are so grateful to you. You have um, kept us sane and honest this entire election cycle. Appreciate you. Love you, friends. Thank you. We're off the rails here on Hallie Jackson now. Why not, right? We're, we're three days, four days from the midterms. We're just going to keep it up. Um, and I got to tell you, Tuesday night, big night, big day, especially from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. That is when myself and Tom Yamas will be anchoring special election night coverage right here, however you're watching on NBC News Now, before the 8 p.m. network special report with Lester Holt, Chuck Todd, Andrea Mitchell, Savannah Guthrie, and many, many more. NBC News covers hundreds of stories each day, and I promise some of them are not midterm related. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, Vermont wildlife officials say a black bear attacked this woman in Vermont in her own yard this week after she let her dog out. Her pup went and chased a bear cub up a tree. Mama bear got mad, right? The woman says it charged her and knocked her down. The dog was eventually found okay, and she's okay, too. From our Southeast Bureau, NASA's Artemis One rocket is back on the launch pad, finally. It took about nine hours to move it four miles from its indoor shelter at the Kennedy Space Center. This mission to send humans back to the moon has been delayed a couple of times. They're now hoping to launch on November 14th. And out of our Western Bureau, a big crash involving something like 100 cars closed part of a highway in Denver this morning. Officials there blame black ice and snow. Police say some drivers were taken to the hospital with minor injuries. It was called the find of the century, the tomb of King Tut in Egypt, discovered by archaeologists 100 years ago today. And it was the discovery of that tomb, which was almost completely intact, that made King Tut the world's most famous pharaoh. On this anniversary, crowds from around the world are flocking to Cairo now to see these 3,000-year-old artifacts. Among them, bracelets, a gold dagger thought to protect the king in the afterlife, the only surviving throne chair from ancient Egypt. And this the most famous artifact of ancient Egypt, King Tut's death mask. NBC's Kelly Kobiea got a private tour of this museum. I mean, talk about the VIP treatment, Kelly. She's joining us now. <laughs> it is so interesting. Tell me what it was like to see this firsthand, the fascination with King Tut that has survived so long after this discovery. Yeah, Hallie, I mean, it was a real privilege to get this kind of access to these artifacts. I mean, think about it, 3,200-year-old uh, items, pieces of art, really, and to see them up close, you notice that incredible artistry, the detailing. 
uh, in the mask, of course, and in those coffins. They were like nesting dolls. So uh, the king was placed in one and then in a larger one. And at the very, at the very base, in, inside the smallest coffin, that mask was placed over his face and shoulders to guide him into the afterlife. And they're just absolutely stunning. And I think part of the fascination is, of course, that they are 3,200 years old. The other part of, you know, they're this very 3D real world link to an ancient, ancient yeah. civilization. And also just, the, again, I said the, the incredible artistry of them and the detail in those coffins, you can see the fine engraving in gold. And the mask, Hallie, that mask, it weighs 22 pounds. It is 22 pounds of gold and it is wow. priceless, of course. Yeah, just of stunning. Of course, I mean, look at it, it's incredible. Um, you did something that I, I'm pretty comfortable saying that I don't think 99.9% .9 of our viewers will ever do, which is you went to a dig site with archeologists as they were uncovering new ancient artifacts, right? Yeah, so this is the site about 20 miles south of Cairo. It's called Saqqara. Uh, and what uh, archaeologists and researchers believe is that this was a huge necropolis. This was a city of the dead. It was where people who had the means 3,000 years ago and even farther back uh, were buried. And they're just really scratching the surface of this site. It's a massive site. They've already found at least one mega tomb with something like 200 coffins in size of inside with varying degrees of intricacy. Some are incredibly intricate and ornate, others are, or, are simpler. Uh, we s looked at one of these coffins, which uh, we believe, archaeologists believe, uh, dates back about 3,000 years, so again, around the time of King Tut. And you don't always know if there's going to be a mummy inside, if this was actually a burial spot, or if this was a coffin that was, yeah. was being prepared for someone. And so it was opened up in front of us, and there before us was a 3,000-year-old mummified body of a woman who, you know, we don't know her story. And there are so many um, wow. artifacts like that and coffins like that in this site at Saqqara just, just waiting to be discovered. In fact, while we were there, uh, the archaeologist we were working with said his team found two more tombs that were sealed. They're going to begin to excavate them at some point, but these are things that they're finding every day. It's a really exciting uh, part of uh, ancient history yeah. waiting to be discovered in Egypt. An incredible experience. It sounds like a great story. Kelly Kobiaya, thank you so much for bringing it to us here on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.